One, two. Good afternoon. My name is Rod McMillian. I now call to order the February 21st, 2023 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee, at the discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison, may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making or seconding a motion is applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jameson or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the team chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jameson, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Lichter. Here. Ms. Joes. Present. Mr. McMillian. Present. Thank you. A, a quorum being present, we will, we will begin. Ms. Jameson, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Present. Ms. Stevens. Present. Ms. Manna. Present. Mr. Fletcher. Present. Mr. Street. Present. Ms. Sample. Present. Ms. Crew. Present. Mr. Edwards. Present. Mr. Hartlove. Present. Mr. Fannin. Present. Dr. McComas. Present. Ms. Shea. Dr. Sullivan. Sorry, Ms. Shea's present. I'm sorry, oh, I couldn't unmute okay. fast enough. Thank, sorry. thank you. <laughs> um, Dr. Sullivan. I think Mr. she may be joining a little bit later. Okay. Ms. Hernandez. Same with her. Okay. We also have a guest from Clifton Larson Allen, Ms. Amos. Is there are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Hearing no additional names, I turn the meeting back to you, Mr. McMillian. Thanks, Ms. Jamison. If committee members have questions that are outside the scope of the reports presented this afternoon, please email Ms. Barr or myself with your questions. We will follow up with the appropriate individuals to get the answers to your questions. Item number three, approval of minutes. The live video footage of our last meeting represents the, the minutes of the meeting. The minutes stand as approved. Item number four, reports. Mr. Hartlove and Ms. Amos, please proceed with the FY22 single audit report. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. McMillian. Um, today we're, we're bringing forward the uh, single audit uh, for review by the audit committee. Um, before I, I, I turn it over to Ms. Amos, I also have, I want to um, give Mr. Uh, Fannin, he's our controller for the school system. I wanted to give him a chance just to um, go over um, the uh, the single audit uh, briefly and then then turn it over to Ms. Ms. Uh, Amos at that point, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so, Mr. Fannin. Okay, um, and uh, hopefully everyone should have a copy of the um, the single audit report. You know, I know it was sent everyone electronically, um, so that's what we're going to be going over. Um, so, first off, is um, BCPS is required every annually to have an independent audit firm conduct our annual financial statement audit and an audit of our federal grants and our schedule of expenditures of federal awards. Uh, this is commonly referred to as the single audit. Um, the schedule of expenditures was prepared by the uh, controller's office and the audit was conducted by Clifton Larson Allen. And again, Sherry's here from Clifton Larson Allen. Um, if you're looking at the report, it's the um, you know, the statements, um, the report includes several different reports and the actual schedule of expenditures and then the findings from the audit. Um, so we'll go over those. The, the uh, single audit report, if, let me back up a second. Each year, different grants are selected for the single audit. And this year it was all the COVID grants, the special education cluster grants, 
and uh, Title II Improving Teacher Quality Grant. And our total expenditures of federal grants this year was a little over $250 million. The bulk of that was the COVID grants, um, was over 100 million of that. Um, so the, the single audit report includes um, two auditor reports. The first is the auditor's report on internal control over financial reporting and compliance and other matters based on the audit financial statements. That's on pages one and two in the um, report that you all have. Um, and the report on page two indicates the auditor's test disclosed no instances of non-compliance or other matters required to be reported under government auditing standards. The uh, second report, which is on pages three through six, is the auditor's report on compliance for each major federal program and the report on internal control over compliance and the report on schedule of expenditures of federal awards. Um, that's a mouthful. <laughs> the report on compliance for each major federal program on page four, it indicates that there are four findings of non-compliance with the federal uniform guidance, and we'll address them um, in a moment. Um, the report on internal control over compliance, which is on page five, uh, it indicates it did not identify any deficiencies in internal controls over compliance that are considered material weaknesses. However, there are significant deficiencies in internal control related to the four findings that um, I just mentioned, and we'll discuss them momentarily. And then the on um, page five and six, the report on the schedule of expenditures of federal awards states that the schedule of expenditure, expenditures of federal awards is fairly stated in all material respects in relation to the financial statements taken as a whole. Um, if you look at pages seven through nine, that's where all of the grants included in the schedule of expenditures are listed. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. And as I mentioned, the COVID grants are the largest amount. They total over a hundred million and then typically the uh, Title I grants are about 38 million, special ed grants are um, about 27 million, and uh, an assortment of other grants. The food service USDA grants was 72 million. Um, so we'll get to the results, which the findings start on pages 12 and 13. Um, go through the first one, the audit dis, um, disclosed the documentation to support the September 21 monthly financial status report to MSD was not retained. Um, and we agree with this finding. What that is, the financial status report is something we prepare and submit monthly to MSDE, and that's how we get reimbursed for our grants. Most of these grants are on a reimbursement basis, so we incur the cost, then we complete the financial status report, it goes to MSD and they reimburse us for our costs. Um, one of those, the um, documentation wasn't retained. We agree with the finding. Um, our, we've implemented corrective action. The staff completing this process were um, new to the process. We had a lot of turnover um, last year and we've implemented procedures to ensure that the documentation is retained and reviewed by the accounting manager. Um, the second finding on page is on page 14. Um, that relates to uh, special education grants. There were some purchases made between uh, $15,000 and $50,000 that had only one vendor quote attached. And our purchasing policies require two quotes for anything between $15,000 and $50,000. And again, we agree with this finding. Um, this was a result of there was only one vendor available at the time. However, that wasn't documented. And again, since we didn't document it, it was a finding. And, um, you know, we work with purchasing and special ed folks to make sure if there is only one vendor available, make sure it's documented, you know, so we can um, justify why we only had the one vendor quote. Um, the third finding is on page 16. And that relates to, 
what's called federal suspension and debarment. Um, the guidelines require us is if we're using vendors and we're issuing purchase orders for those vendors over a certain dollar amount, we have to check what's called the federal suspension and debarment list. That is a list of vendors who were suspended or debarred from doing business with the federal government for whatever reason. And we have to check and make sure that the vendor we're going to use is not suspended or debarred. And um, we do that, but we didn't retain the, the date that we checked. So corrective action wise, we've trained all the grant folks in January to start when they take a snapshot of that federal website where we can check it. That website doesn't actually have a date on it, but we're going to have folks take a snapshot of their screen and save the date from the bottom right hand corner of their screen so we can show the date that it was checked and make sure it was before the purchase order was issued. So that's the key part there. Um, the fourth finding, which starts on page 18, is related to um, food service and our uh, ESSER grants, which are part of the COVID grants. There was $3,059,000 from the um, COVID-19 elementary secondary relief funds that were allocated to the food service fund. Additionally, food service uh, receives funding through the United States Department of Agriculture to cover these same costs. This occurred because the ESSER funds were planned to be used for food service in fiscal year 22, the same way we had used it in fiscal year 20 and 21, offset shortfalls in revenue due to the pandemic. Um, it was uh, done to ensure that, that we had concerns about the sustainability of food service as a program due to the loss of revenue. Um, we wanted to make sure we kept staff, food service staff employed during the pandemic. Um, and again, they were they were used the same way as we did in the prior years to offset the lost revenue because we weren't getting any. Uh, there was a lot fewer meals served and we had none of the other revenue for what they call a la carte items and paid lunches. And that to normally totals about $12 million a year and that was all lost. Um, and then ultimately in fiscal year 22, which was different from the earlier years, Food service was reimbursed at much higher rates um, through what they was called the summer feeding program rates. Those rates were significantly higher than the normal meal reimbursement rates. And at the time, we didn't know exactly how much revenue we were ultimately going to get from that. When it was said and done, we, we received more than we expected. And um, that's how we ended up with the um, question costs and uh, and our corrective action is we're not going to have a need to use those ESSER funds for food service to supplement food service any longer. Um, and I think um, is that it, Mr. Um, Mr. Fannin? Um, yeah. yeah. OK, well, uh, thank you, uh, Pat, for that summary. Um, I'll turn it over to uh, uh, Ms. Amos uh, from Clifton Larson Allen to and uh, highlight whatever you want to highlight. Uh, you know, floor is yours. Sure, sure. Uh, Mr. Fan actually stole a lot of my thunder, so thank you, Pat, for uh, going through all those findings and all <laughs> for me. Um, I will add just a couple quick things for a little bit more context. Um, when it comes to the single audit, which of course is, as we said, is your audit of your federal expenditures for under grant awards. There's um, a lot of specific guidance that's provided to us as auditors from the federal government that we must um, abide by as we do this audit. Um, and a lot of that has to do with um, how we select the programs for testing and also what compliance areas that we test as well. Um, so a lot of our audits really dictated by the federal government it really isn't um, much wiggle room we have, so to speak, in terms of um, what we're looking at. Um, as Mr. Fannin did say, your um, total expenditures were approximately 250 million. Um, we were required to test at least a minimum of 40% of those expenditures. Um, by uh, testing the four programs that we did, which is to recap were the coronavirus state and local fiscal relief funds, which is a part of the American Rescue Plan, the special education cluster, um, the Education Stabilization Fund, which is part of ESSER, 
and then as well as the um, Title II grants, we actually obtained um, approximately 52 percent or, or around $130 million worth of coverage on your SEPA. That's um, a total of $250 million. So we did well exceed the requirement that was needed, um, but due to um, federal regulations on rotation, uh, which required us to test special education, and then federal requirements for us to test um, all funding that had COVID funding in it, um, we actually were able to get above, well above that 40% threshold um, just due to the federal government kind of dictating which programs we needed to look at. So just to add a little bit more context to that, uh, Mr. Kennedy did a very good job going through the findings. I, I mean, I would say the first three that he went through um, were really more of a documentation type of finding. Um, we didn't see anything that we thought was um, improper or incorrect. It was just more the school system didn't have the documentation um, contemporaneously as decisions were being made for us to be able to validate that during the audit. So um, just really want to reiterate just the making sure that as decisions are being made and we're spending these grant awards that the documentation um, whenever a decision has to be made, whether it be um, to check a suspension and debarment before a contract is entered or obtaining quotes that we're documenting what we're doing so that way it's there in writing. We have an audit trail. Um, as Mr. Hartlove said, there is a lot of turnover that's happened, which is not abnormal right now. Um, so really that documentation becomes cru crucial um, when audits are done six months, nine months, a year later than when decisions are being made. Um, it's really hard to kind of go back and retrace steps at that point. So I um, just want to reiterate that. Um, the last finding related to um, the uh, ESSER funding being used to cover food service costs that were already covered by the child nutrition cluster really kind of was a one off, I would say. Um, I don't think anybody, any school system in Maryland um, uh, foresaw obtaining the amount of revenue that all school systems in Maryland saw related to child nutrition cluster this year. It was a little unprecedented um, to be able to kind of foresee that it would cover um, all the costs that you had for the year of running the food service operation. So um, I, I think, you know, that was just, a, I would say maybe an isolated instance at that point um, that we probably wouldn't see um, very often or hopefully going forward. So um, with that, I will gladly answer any questions that you guys might have. I think a couple people do. <laughs> yes, Ms. Joes was first, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Um, and I don't know if you are the correct person to ask this question to. For the SR findings, the $3 million that we charge to the child nutrition cluster, how is that going to be reimbursed back to the system? And I, I don't know if that's you and Mr. Hartlow. How would you rectify that, uh, balance that $3 million? I don't, at this point, we have not, We the, the ball's really in the federal government's court. So at this point, um, the the dollars have not been. Uh, they know of the of the of the um, of the uh, finding, um, but we have not been asked to uh, um, um, send those those dollars back. If we do, we are we are in we're in very good shape to be able to do that. So it will it will not be any kind of a hardship um, in the food service area if we were to have to do that. Uh, just to provide a little context with that, well, we had three million of question cost. The total ESSER expenditures were almost ninety-six million dollars. So um, it, it's it is a, it is a lot of money, but in the total scheme of the whole program, it really is a is an insignificant dollar amount compared to what was totally spent on ESSER. Okay, Ms. Joe. Well, um, in, in a follow up, so for the federal suspension, it looks like um, you just did. None of the vendors that we chose were disbarred by the federal government. It's just that you didn't document that and you looked up at SAM.gov and it was not documented. Am I correct? But so, no vendors. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So we were able to do the vendor check at the time of the audit and verified at the time of the audit that the vendor was not suspended or debarred. Uh, however, there's no way to go back in time at the the as when the contract was entered to be able to verify that for sure, um, which is why you know the documentation needs to be kind of maintained at that moment. Um, but we did as part of our audit make sure that the 
vendor was not suspended or debarred. So that's why I, I kind of see that as more of a documentation kind of finding versus a non-compliance finding, if that makes sense. Right, that's what I figured it was more of a documentation of failure yep. to. OK, um, I have some follow, but I'll let Ms., uh, somebody else go. Thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Barr, please. Thank you. I, I did have the same question as Ms. Joe's about the, the three million dollars and the question cost return to the feds. If they do ask us to return it, will it come out of the um, food service fund? Yes. OK. And then I have an, uh, another question um, related to the, I believe it was the special ed that uh, they said there was only one bidder. Was it, or I mean, only one vendor? Was it considered sole source or was there only one vendor that bid? Could you just clarify well, that, please? It, it was only one vendor available at the time. As you know, during those times, it was everybody was using the same vendors for everything. And they couldn't get quotes from more than one vendor for that service, whatever it was. So it wasn't like a sole source or anything. They just could only find one vendor who was able to provide the services and they didn't document that. So since the requirement was get two quotes, they only had one. So it was just a matter of documentation. If they would have documented that we tried to get more than one vendor, but only one would give us a quote, then, you know, that probably would have been OK. But again it's a documentation issue and there was question costs only for the um food service esser there were not question costs associated with any other findings okay correct. thank you correct, correct. Yep. thank you any additional questions hearing no questions we're finished with this thank you very much for your time Ms. Thank Anderson, you. And mr fannin thank you <laughs> thank you we're going to move on. Ms. Sample and Ms. Stevens, please proceed with the FY23 ESOL dash new immigrant enrollment audit report. Thank you, Mr. McMillan. I can share my screen um, and show the report as I speak. Can everyone see that? Yes, I can. Yes. Okay, great. So we completed the ESOL new immigrant enrollment audit and issued the final report on February 16, 2023. The report can be found on board docs for this meeting and it is posted on the internal audits website. So ESOL stands for English for Speakers of Other Languages. The ESAW office assesses and identifies multilingual learners and works to provide those students with ESAW services. The objective of the audit was to determine if the ESAW enrollment process supports the needs of new immigrant students. We wanted to know if English learner children or EL children and their families were supported with ESAW registration and that they were receiving ESAW services. And our focus of the audit was limited to the registration process. I'm going to scroll down and talk about commendations. Before we get into the issues, we'd like to talk about two commendations we made note of in the report. The first commendation is related to ESAW resources. The ESAW office has provided clear and concise enrollment guidance for multilingual families on their website. The ESAW website and the ESAW wiki group on Schoology has enrollment guidance for school staff. Also, ESAW office staff conducts a comprehensive training session for school staff responsible for registering EL students. The second commendation is related to refusal of ESAW services. Parents may opt out of receiving recommended ESAW services for their child. And for the students that we reviewed who had opted out, we saw that documentation was on file and available to support that parents actually refused the ESOL services. A third commendation that's not here, but we'd like to point out is the high level of cooperation we received for this audit from Dr. Sullivan and those in her, in her, in her office. Whenever we needed information, Someone was always available and we received incredible support during this audit. So next, 
Deborah Stevens and I will discuss the four issues we identified. And for each recommendation, Dr. Aaron Sullivan with ESOL will discuss the corrective action. And so the first issue is related to current staffing levels for the ESOL office. At the time we issued the report, there were 20 budgeted positions, but only 10 are staffed. And we learned that five of the vacant positions are currently frozen because of budget cuts. The other positions were advertised, or they were being advertised or getting approval to be advertised. So when the ESOL office isn't fully staffed, there's the potential that registrations are delayed, students, are, students aren't getting registered timely. There's also the risk that institutional knowledge is lost when only one staff member is trained for a position. And so our recommendation is that vacancies get filled and staffing levels be evaluated to determine if additional staffing resources are needed. I'll turn it over to Dr. Aaron Sullivan to discuss the corrective action for this recommendation. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Um, so it, this, I really appreciated this entire process because I think whenever we can get some support, um, we really welcome that in the office of ESOL. So thank you for all the hard work that the audit team did. Um, <clears throat> so to begin, um, so we have been working closely with the Office of um, Human Resources to identify candidates. We have um, conducted ESOL specialist interviews. Unfortunately, the first um, round of interviews were unsuccessful. Um, we have also been able to hire um, in recent months, in the past month or two, um, the two vacant bilingual program assistants at the Welcome Center. Um, but we have some ongoing vacancies for our resource teachers. Um, we have some family school liaison vacancies, which are posted, um, are now posted, but we haven't been able um, to hire. We haven't had any viable candidates yet for a um, to hold interviews. Um, so again, we're working really closely to um, try to hire for those positions as quickly as we can, um, because obviously it does um, put a strain on our resources. We also have um, a vacant, um, we, we've had a vacancy for the school nurse um, and the school social worker at the Welcome Center, which has limited some of the additional supports we were able to provide at the Welcome Center. Um, so in addition, um, knowing that our population is continuing to grow at rapid rates and knowing that they have a lot of unique challenges, I have also um, just written into our immigrant grant um, five additional positions that will work um, at or with the Welcome Center. Um, and so those positions as a, in reaction to the audit report, um, recommendation that we continue to look for ways to um, support this growing population. That is one thing we were able to do. That that immigrant grant is in the process of being approved by MSD right now, and we hope to be able to hire some of those positions um, this spring. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Deborah Stevens will discuss the next two results. Thanks, Ms. Sample. So our next issue uh, deals with the home language survey. Um, we determined that the home lang language survey data has not always been documented for students, um, and it would be a certain two certain populations of students, those who enroll um, into BCPS through the parent portal and those who are re-enrolling into BCPS. So in uh, the home language survey is a series of three questions that is required to be asked of all of our newly um, enrolling students to help determine what their native language is, their primary home language, and their the primary language that's actually used by the student. These um, questions are required by MSDE, and that is to help um, the school system identify those children that uh, need some additional um, help, you know, getting um, up to date with the uh, English language. So in focus, there is a um, control that uh, will not allow a child to be enrolled if that uh, language uh, survey information has not been provided. However, there are two ways that that 
uh, control can be bypassed. One is um, if a student enrolls through the parent portal, which is an online enrollment system versus going directly to the school, um, once the parent gets to a certain point within that um, parent portal, the student is assigned a uh, ID number. Once that ID number has been assigned, then the controls in focus uh, no longer work um, to prevent a student from being enrolled without that home language survey. So at that point, it would be up to the school to realize that the home language survey data is not there and they um, should recognize that it's not there and, and get that information entered into focus. Um, the other way is if a student re-enrolls, they already have a BCPS ID number. So again, the focus control um, would be bypassed at that point. Um, so part of the problem with this is that, um, you know, we want to make sure that all students that um, indicate that they are non-English in more than two of those areas um, are receiving at least an assessment to see if they are in need of EL services. Um, so we would like to recommend that um, the home language survey data for the students that we identified in the audit um, is obtained and analyzed to make sure that these students uh, don't need additional assistance. Um, we'd also like to see the controls um, amped up a bit in focus to make sure that and, and also the parent portal to make sure that they can't be bypassed. So and then also to develop a system wide uh, focus report that ESOL staff and school staff can um, routinely run within focus to monitor um, if that required HLS data is there. So and we did this um, as a data analytics um, process within the audit. So we were able to look at all, it's about 9,500 students that um, had uh, enrolled in BCPS uh, for this current school year up through November 30th. So, uh, so I will turn it over to Dr. Sullivan to uh, talk about the corrective action. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> as a result um, of the work going on during this audit, um, DOIT has already begun the work on that focus report. Um, so that's already in production so that we can monitor um, any one who comes comes in or re-enters who doesn't have those questions identified. Um, and so of those 57 identified students, we've also gone back because obviously we need to um, determine if any of those students need the services now. As a, a, to date, um, we're still working through some of them, but none of those identified students um, should have been assessed for ESOL services. So their responses were all English. Um, so, <clears throat> um, so, so yes, we have to build that report and we're, we're working with Jocelyn Lear to build that report. Um, and our goal is for July 1, by July 1, when sh which is when our um, enrollment really starts to pick up quite a bit a lot, uh, quite a bit, um, that that report will be ready. And then we will build it into our um, standard operating procedures to routinely pull that report. Um, and one, um, and um, working with, uh, Jocelyn would come up with ways that we can best identify students um, who were either missed or even misidentified. Um, sometimes that happens too. So we're going to build in some ways and focus to identify that. Um, so that is our corrective action, action for that. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the third issue. Uh, again, this relates back to the home language survey. Uh, so we looked at the 9,500 students uh, that had enrolled um, for this year up through November 30th, and we looked at those students um, who answered non-English for more for at least two questions, two or three questions, and then we took a look to see that they were um, so had some type of EL status. So they were either assessed and did not need services, or they were receiving services, or they had age, um, had moved out of the program, that sort of thing. So we did identify 182 students that indicated uh, non-English in two or more categories or questions that we could not uh, tell whether they had um, been assessed or not. So uh, part of that issue is that, you know, these students may need services and that you know, they aren't receiving them. So we did um, recommend that the EL status be determined for all of 182 students. And again, um, automate focus to 
um, put a control in that any student that answers, you know, uh, non-English in two or more categories is automatically identified as a pen with a pending status for uh, their EL status. And that way it would make it easy to run a focus report to find any students that are still with a, a pending status uh, to ensure that these students are being assessed in a timely manner. So I will turn it back to Dr. Sullivan. Thank you. Um, so we um, looked at these 182 cases um, to determine um, you know, what was what was happening so that these students wouldn't be assessed um, or identified for assessment. <clears throat> so the most prominent cases um, we can list into three different categories. The first were Maryland transfers. So right now at the Welcome Center, we see all students grades one through 12 who are new to the country or new to the state. We do not um, enroll Maryland transfers at the Welcome Center because much of the work that we do at the Welcome Center in terms of the assessments are already done um, in another system. And we found that um, 110, so the vast majority of these students were Maryland transfers. Um, in order to identify the students who are Maryland transfers as Ls, English learners, we asked the schools to complete an, ESA, an EL update form when, Mar when Maryland transfers arrived to their school. Um, and what, what we were finding was <clears throat> um, a lot of times the schools were not following through with that um, EL update form. Um, so, um, one of the things that we already had in process was developing an EL update form that's directly in focus. We did this with a K update form um, at the beginning of the school. Um, at the beginning of the school year, we have we identify over a thousand kindergarten students who do not also do not come through the Welcome Center, and the schools have to give us that information. And it's very it's been lab very labor intensive in the past. So we worked with DOIT to develop this update form directly in focus that really streamlines things um, and makes it a lot easier. Um, so we were already working on that, and that's another um, piece that we were working with Jocelyn Lear's team to have, um, have ready for um, <clears throat> July 1 um, rollover. Uh, so that will help. Um, and then again, working with our training. We do train the enrollment liaisons. We're always a part of every en enrollment liaison um, training for the year, but to make sure that information is reiterated. Um, but we do think that that will help having that update form. In addition to that home language survey flag, those two pieces will help us. Um, the, the other um, groups of students were case students who um, the form that I was just discussing that we just um, implemented, we were able to identify over a thousand students, but there were 17 incidences where the form was rejected and teachers didn't um, follow up again. Um, and so we think that this is a um, the form the this form that we already talked about, uh, this report for the um, home language survey will help with that but um, also additional training for um, our ESOL teachers. We rolled this up out in September, and again, we enrolled over um, a, a thousand kindergarten students, and so there were 17K incidences. So we think that we can really improve upon that next year and ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, <clears throat> and then the final group were BCPS transfers. So because they were transferring, uh, but what we found was the, the code for the BCPS BCPS transfer was in error. So it looked like they were transferring from one BCPS school to another. And so that would not flag for the Welcome Center because we assume that they've already gone through the process. It turns out that these students were not BCPS transfers. So that flag was incorrect. Um, and so we're trying to work with Office of Student Support Services to figure out how can we work. Uh, we're, we're planning on working with them to share these records so that we can figure out why, how, where did that breakdown occur for those. Um, it was a small number of kids, but there were a small number of kids who were misidentified in uh, focus. And so those are the different, a lot of these are techno technology and training. So training of both ESOL staff as well as the training of the liaisons. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. Thank you. We'll move on to the last issue. And for the last issue, we found that the ESOL Welcome Center student assessment area is not adequate. And the primary concern was that the assessment areas had little privacy or protection from noise. 
the Esau Welcome Center is housed in the BCPS Catonsville Administration Building, which is a former elementary school building. There are only three small cubicles available for assessing EL students, and if more than three students need to be assessed at one time, the students are seated at a desk near a stage where there is no privacy or protection from noise and visual distractions. Um, on the day we internal audit visited the Welcome Center, conversations between staff and family members could be heard throughout the entire center, including the assessment area. Also on the day we visited, the other areas of the Catonsville Administration Building were completely empty, not being used. So there's a concern that students may get distracted by noise in the Welcome Center and, they, and may not be assessed correctly. Additionally, family members may have to stand, sit on the floor, or wait in their cars if there is an adequate seating for them. And so our recommendation for this result is to work with the supervisor of the Catonsville Administration Building to determine if other areas of the building can be used by the Esau Welcome Center. We also recommend that the ESAW office implement the ESAW mobile unit. Now I'll turn it back over to Dr. Sullivan to discuss the corrective action. So, um, thank you. So we are really excited to tell you that the Mobile Welcome Center will launch this spring. We're in final, final production. We're um, students at Kenwood High School are working on the final wrap for the Mobile Welcome Center. Um, and the Mobile Welcome Center will allow for both um, assessment as well as family programming. Um, uh, we, on the outside, there's a giant screen and there's an awning so we can do programming with like within the, the bus, the, the bus, but also outside of it. So we will hope to use those to to that but that mobile to go directly to um, communities because we have a lot of communities that have a difficult time getting all the way to Cadenceville. Um, so that is one way. Um, <clears throat> but um, we also will work uh, the our, the leader, my leadership, uh, Megan Shea, um, will be working with um, the divisions to see if there are some additional spaces available that we may be able to utilize um, as our as our need for the testing space grows. We have we were we are sometimes limited. We have a um, for, with appointments based on space. So we have a number of contractual support that we use during our high season. But we um, we even when we have enough people there to test, we don't have enough space to um, have more than uh, four or five appointments at a time. And so having more space would allow us to um, meet the needs of the families more quickly and enroll students faster. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. All right, so the ESAW office received a needs improvement audit rating for the new immigrant enrollment process which essentially means that controls related to ESAW registration only partially address key risks and improvements are needed. So that is the end of the presentation related to this audit. Mr. McMillian, I will turn it back over to you for questions. Great. Thank you very much for your efforts. Uh, committee members, any questions? Mr. McMillian, I have a question. Yes, please, Ms. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, so my first question is on the vacancies that you have for the five out of 10 ESOL positions are currently frozen due to budget cuts and you only advertised five. Um, so I don't know if that's a question to you or to Ms. Shea or Ms. Uh, Dr. McComb is, have you guys put that budget in the budget request, those additional five positions? So, is it, <laughs> excuse me, Ms. Joseph, I'm sorry, it's taking me a minute to, to uh, respond. So, it, um, and Aaron, please correct me if I'm wrong. These are positions we actually already have, but we were not able to fill because there's really a, a shortage across the board on people who are certified for ESOL. And Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong on that. 
Yeah, and the two um, liaison positions, they're all resource teacher level positions. So after the start of September 1st, when we had so many teaching vacancies, we hold on hiring because we don't want to be pulling from the building. So we have recently started advertising for two of those five, um, but the resource, the ones that are just, so the family school liaisons are technically resource teachers as well. And then we have three resource teachers who help with academics. Yeah, so we we prioritize, we get excited this time of year, Ms. Jess, when we can advertise because we hope to maybe draw in ESOL uh, professionals from other school systems or perhaps newly graduate ESOL um, certified teachers. And we do have an interview next tomorrow for a special. We have another second round of interviews for specialists tomorrow. Um, and there is a potential, there are some strong candidates who we could also potentially offer a resource, te uh, resource teacher position for starting in June if, if they're a, good, a qualified candidate. And, and if I can mm -hmm. to just add one more clarifying piece, good afternoon. Um, it's not unusual for us to pause filling resource teacher positions once school has started because quite often these positions come from classroom teacher positions. Oftentimes the resource teacher position is their first leadership role. Um, and especially this year, um, you'll recall that in the fall we were actually deploying central resource teachers to fill staffing vacancies in schools. And so it's not that unusual to pause positions if we have not filled them by the time school is underway, because oftentimes to do so would pull a teacher out of the classroom. And when you're already facing staffing shortages, um, we would never do that. In the past, if we were filling a position after the school year started, it was always conditioned upon that classroom position being filled. So let's say I had in the past a resource teacher vacancy um, that I was still interviewing for in October, I might fill it, but the condition would be contingent upon that school hiring someone. And with the current um, just staffing crisis across BCPS and the state, that is unlikely because we already have vacancies. So I also I know that budget cuts phrase um, is probably a misnomer at that moment because it more had to do with the larger cycle around um, staffing challenges. Um, and of course, our priority, while we want to offer this resource position, we believe it's so important to serve the families in the county. Um, we never pull a teacher from kids to, to do that once school has started until we feel confident that we can um, backfill that vacancy. And that's not unique to ESOL. Um, that actually is not atypical across the board. So I just wanted to add that for context. So, Ms. Shea, I think if I remember correctly, at the last budget request or just a few weeks ago, you said your ESOL teacher ratio is still 52 to 1 or 53, if I remember correctly. Correct. Um, if, so if we get everything how many more request. positions would you need with the new blueprint that's also coming on? And would that help Dr. Sullivan, Ms. Sullivan? Sorry. You know, how many more positions are needed and how is blueprint going to help that? Do you want to? Uh, you know, so I'll start and then I'll let Dr. Sullivan, you are correct. Um, okay. And that ratio is for us to maintain and slightly reduce our ratio um, with our growth and enrollment. So if we get the entirety of our request of ESOL positions, um, that maintains that ratio um, that you just identified. In terms of how many positions we need, I mean, we could use hundreds before we uh, were at the right space because of our incredible growth. Um, the challenge, of course, is positions doesn't equal people. And and so um, I'll turn to Dr. Sullivan if she wants to try to give a more fine point, but um, that really is that intersection right now between the, the growth of our students and the need for positions and then the actual human beings to fill them. But um, Dr. Sullivan, I don't know if you have a specific number, but it's it's a <coughs> lot. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I, and you mentioned blueprint. If, if at some point um, ESOL goes into pre-K, which is Part of the recommendations and pre-K becomes universal. Um, that that our, the number would be astronomical at that point. That what we would need. Our largest number of students is at the kindergarten level. We would add roughly 600 students um, in pre-K right now. Um, so we need to we need more teachers to cover that. So yes. So Megan's right. We're always trying to balance. Like, what do we think we can reasonably hire for? Um, <clears throat> And what do we need? And so we, over the years, uh, um, ex, you know, we've got more and more positions, except for 
during COVID years, uh, things slowed down a little bit, but we were maintaining about 50 to one. Um, so what happens is we get huge growth throughout the year. So by the end of the year, our ratio is much higher. And so we're always trying to bring it back to that 50. We 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 do now have um, L projections. So we our, our staffing request is based on L projections um, for, so, so we hope that if we're getting that, we, we should be at 50 to one. We would like it to be lower, but I feel like that's the bare minimum and that's what we would need with those 36. Um, if we don't get all 36, I think it will be really uh, problematic. If I may just take okay. the opportunity. I'm sorry, Ms. Joyce, go ahead. No, go ahead, Dr. McClellan. OK, thank you. I, I just um, just while we're on this talking about, you know, sort of the, the largest levels of challenge here. Uh, additional nuance to staffing for ESOL is it is not a formula uh, formula funded. Uh, what I mean by that is, of course, we know as our overall student enrollment goes up, that equates to a certain amount of additional teachers. Um, and we have a formula for overall enrollment. We do not have a formula that specifically addresses our ESOL students. And so as a result, as you're familiar, Ms. Joes, every year we are bringing forward a request for additional ESOL teachers, specifically ESOL teachers, uh, because it's not um, sort of structured into the formula funding. Uh, so that's part of our ongoing uh, challenges over time. And uh, additionally, as we said, um, finding people in the marketplace who are certified, it is something that our colleges and universities um, really locally have not uh, necessarily prioritized. And I know that uh, Dr. Sullivan's working, you know, with MSDE to try to help our universities understand that we need, that, that needs to be a priority among teacher preparation and teacher training, um, and that this is no longer uh, a small population in our state, but this is a rapidly growing population, and of course we're feeling it. So just to kind of give some of those larger pieces that also influence our staffing and then our ability to fill positions once we actually get them in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McComas, Ms. Shea, and Dr. Sullivan. The only reason I'm asking those is because it is budget season, and yeah. I want to make sure that these um, Deficiencies are, are responded to, and I know last year your team asked for the mobile unit uh, in the budget, and that was the board approved it. Will you need additional staff to implement this mobile unit? I mean, ideally, yes. I mean, we're going to use contractual staff because one of the challenges with having multiple sites is if we go off site and we send our staff off site, then um, we will have families who just show up at the Welcome Center who have taken off, who have figured out how to get to Cadenville, and um, it, it, I, I always want to be able to serve them too. So we'll be utilizing our contractual staff quite a bit to, for the for the Mobile Welcome Center. But as we explore more options for the Welcome Center in general, and and recognize that we have a huge geographical county, um, if we did have additional staffing to uh, full-time staffing to support more spaces. I think that really in the long run is what we'll need. Yeah, and I was just going to chime in to say um, to your question, Ms. Jones, and, and, and we greatly appreciate the support and even just having the opportunity to talk about the needs and, and have the, the request. We just also want to be mindful that we can fill them. So we I, I want to answer that we need 100, but I know I, I can't staff that. Um, but one of the other conversations we've been having is that we are a system that having even just a welcome center is not sufficient because it creates barriers for families to even um, reach the center for those services. So of course the mobile center, which we're very excited about, is a strategy. But what we're also talking about is as different communities come online for capital projects around construction, that becomes a part of the conversation that we have with our facilities. That's why the partnership with facilities is so critically important. Um, because ideally we would have multiple welcome centers um, throughout the system. But to your point, if and when we get to that place, that would require multiple teams to staff them so that families don't have to wait. So we're not there yet. We have a plan for contractual staff to support that mobile opportunity, um, but should we get to a place where, which we hope to get to over multiple years, where we have um, static locations as well as the mobile um, for flexibility, then we would need additional staffing um, to do that. 
And if I just may add our mobile center, it has taken us. Um, we've been working on getting this together. Uh, for seven years, it's taken us seven years to get to this point, um, and we are just grateful that the level of awareness and understanding of our needs around Esau is in a very different place today, thanks to all of you uh, and your support um, compared to where things were seven, seven and a half years ago when Dr. Sullivan and I first had a conversation around the need to expand the Welcome Center and have a mobile unit that could go to our families as opposed to expecting our families always to come to us. So, so thank you for your support in, in the long haul on this. Okay, Ms. Lichter. Um, I had like, a similar question to Ms. Joe's as far as the frozen part and then, um, Megan, you used the word paused. Was paused the same thing as frozen? So the first, um, the family school liaison positions were actually, um, the term that was used with us was frozen. Those were unfrozen. Um, and then Dr. Sullivan was able to um, post them. The resource teacher positions, it, I would say, are more in the pause because there was not an official communication that they were frozen, but more part of the general practice that once school year's underway, we don't post and fill because it would pull a classroom. So I would make a distinction between the two. The family school liaison positions, because they're not instructional at all, those were frozen because every expenditure that's not instructional is really looked at with a very fine tooth comb. Um, we were able, through Dr. McComas's advocacy, to explain how critical those positions were for families and supporting the ultimate goal of instruction, and so then they were unfrozen. The resource teacher traditional positions, I would say, were more of the pause variety, but I would welcome Dr. Sullivan to correct me, but that's my understanding. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, Ms. Lichter, additional questions? Nope, I'm good. Thank you. Okay, that wraps up this audit. Thank you very much for all the time and energy. Uh, the people have put into it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all the support of Esau. Always. <laughs> We're going to move on to item five, new business. Mr. Fletcher, please proceed with the investigations update. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I'm going to share my screen now as well. And you should be able to now see um, our report for the January 2023 uh, investigative unit, or I'm sorry, the investigative um, update. And so this is a report, I'm going to slide down, jump right in and table one. Uh, this is a report of our investigative stats for the month of January 2023. In January, we received 17 cases. Table one summarizes those cases, which shows that four will be investigated by the Office of Internal Audit, two were referred to BCPS management for investigation, and 11 will be closed with a memo to file as the information provided was not in the purview of the hotline. And so for the four cases that were kept by the Office of Internal Audit, two were conflict of interest, one was a management issue, and one was a misuse of resources. So as we slide into table two, hand down here. So we note that in addition to the 17 new cases that we received, 11 were already open from the previous month. And so there were 28 cases that were actually open during the month of January. And during the month, 10 cases were closed, which resulted in 18 cases open as of the end of the month, as of January 31st. Now, for the Office of Internal Audit Investigations, which is this first column here, 11 were open throughout the month and one was closed, resulting in 10 open as of January 31st. Details for all of those cases are available in Table 3, uh, which is down below on page 5. This column here talks about our management investigations. Two of those were open uh, during the month and both remain open as of the close of the month. Details for those cases are available in table four, which is actually page six below. And then our last, co or our, our, our last column of, of um, cases are for our memo to file, cases that are outside the purview of the hotline. We had 15 that were open throughout the month, and then nine were closed, resulting in six that were still open as of the end of the month. And details for those cases are available in table five, which is below on page seven. 
And again, this document is available in board docs. Um, these are tables three, four, and five uh, are, the, are the tables that I just referenced above. And Mr. McMillian, I turn it back over to you for any questions. Yep. Mr. Fletcher, I've got a question myself real Certainly. quickly. If I was still teaching, can you give me an example of a memo to file that you guys would uh, place in my folder? Absolutely. So it would not go in your employee folder or anything like that. Uh, that would be a uh, a perfect example of something that we would memo to file uh, would be if someone were to report into the hotline. Uh, I'm trying to think of, of a, a more recent one. Um, uh, but typically, if, if there's any type of conflict uh, with the teacher, so if a, if a student or a, a parent were to comment and say, no, I, this teacher did this the other day in class, that's not a, a fraud, waste, and a, or abuse um, allegation. And so that's more appropriate for uh, the executive director to address. And so what we would do is we would forward that information to the executive director for their review and disposition. Um, and, and allow them to handle that. Does that help? Yes, and then it would go into the memo to file. Correct. We create a memo to file so that we can close it on our end. Uh, we store that within our ethics point uh, platform. And the reason why we do that is in case we, we see a pattern. Pattern, right. And so we see it come in second, third, fourth time. We'll still provide that information to the executive director, but now we're going to start asking some more questions. What have you done with this in the past? What would have been the, the results of your reviews? And, and try to seek an addition, some additional level of closure for that. Good. Thank you very much. Ms. Joes. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Detective Fletcher, sorry, Mr. Fletcher. <laughs> your table um, three, it has yes, those 11... Uh, cases those yes. are open and pending still so the first one is the one that was closed during the month and, and we unsubstantiated that allegation and then items two through 11 the, so these 10 are the ones that are still open uh, that our office is is conducting the investigation for and so they can be in various stages of of completion uh, from some of them may not have even begun yet uh, and some maybe in the in the final reporting process And so were these all received in your hotline or? Uh, it's a combination. So uh, predominantly, yes, they come in through our hotline. However, sometimes we will receive uh, phone calls, emails, um, and just run into people uh, sometimes and, and we'll, we'll be passed information. Um, what we do is once we receive that, anything that comes to us that is not through the hotline, uh, we will enter that information into our hotline so that we can then triage it and treat it just like any other um, information that was reported to us. Thank you. I know these are open, so I can't ask you any more questions, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly. Any additional questions? Hearing no questions, thank you very much, Mr. Flesher. I'm going to move thank on you. to item six, announcements. The next meeting of the audit committee will be on Tuesday, March 21st, 2023 at 4.30 p.m. Thank you very much for everybody that attended and contributed to the success of this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening. Thanks. Good night.